to stop apologizing for changing jobs. There's an upside sometimes in changing jobs because people change jobs correctly. Yes. Tend to end more. We need school. There's enough evidence that proves that educated people post grade 12 have a 63% premium wage versus people who drop out of high school. I never dreamt that I'll be a global, yeah. I'll be a CMO for Google. It's just, it was impossible mm. to be in a shack and be thinking that way. It's just scarcity mm. does that to your brain. Don't hold back, say it loud. What's up everybody? My name is Nozivele Kwamgana Mayava. Welcome to Don't Hold Back. This is where we say it loud. Now let's talk about it. The South African job market is very, very hard. It's hard to find a job, particularly for graduates that just came out of university. I work with young people that often ask me, Nozi, how do I stand out? How do I sell myself? How do I make sure that my CV is top notch so that I can be a first choice for a recruiter? Now we're going to talk more about this with Brand Genius, the man behind the brands, Chief Executive or Chief Marketing Officer rather for Google Africa, Mzamo Masit. Thank you for coming to the show. Thank you very much. I've been following your work and I, I, I have to admit I'm a big fan. I'm a huge fan. I'm trying to restrain myself as much as I can, but we're going to see where it goes. Okay. Before we get into, um, you know, the episode and what we're going to discuss about, there's a tradition in the show where you bring a snack. Um, don't tell me why you brought the snack, but just tell me what you have. Okay. What I have is bacon bites. Okay. And bar one. That's an interesting combo. <laughs> As an introduction to our audience, let me get to know Umzabo, the man behind the brand, um, your personal brand. How would you introduce yourself? I always start with values because I've mm. always found that's what anchors me. Mm. So I only have three values. First one being respect, mm -hmm. second one Ubuntu, mm. and third one freedom. I love that. So I live by those three things. Mm. So when I'm no title, when I don't have a title, yeah. no certificates, mm. I'm those three things. Mm. And even if I didn't have the titles, certificates, I'll be those three things. Yeah. So that's what I say to people. Freedom, because I grew up under apartheid. Yeah. So I know how it feels like not to be free. Mm. So it's not an intellectual exercise. It's a lived-in mm. experience. And I really, really love freedom mm. for everyone, including for myself. Mm -hmm. Second thing, I, Ubuntu, I was lucky enough to be sent to a village, a young, and I learned that there's value in being communal. Mm. Because when someone loses a cow or their entire crop mm. fails, the entire village will club mm. and help that person and restore their dignity. Mm. It feels like to me, village people had already understood that there's something good about healthy interdependency, yes. which I think the West had lost. Yeah. There's high levels of individualism, Absolutely. which actually makes us sick. Mm. And so I found like village people have been wise mm. all along. Mm. And only now the West seems to be catching up mm. to being communal, that relationships keep us happy and mm. healthy. Then the third thing for me is just respect. Mm. I guess because I grew up poor and I grew up in kind of informal settlement, poor people are very invisible and disrespected. Mm. And I remember when my mom was a domestic worker mm. and how invisible yeah she was yeah. to many people mm. so i kind of feel like my role will be to make those who are invisible mm. become visible Mzamo, you've worked for like quite a number of companies mm. one that i've noted nike vodacom unilever and now google mm. um we come from a, a, a you know a background where our moms would stay with one employer um for a number of years my mom mm. you know worked for a tb hospital for 29 years wow. before she retired um so when i started working i've been with probably about five companies so far mm. um so do you think the days of company loyalty are far gone um considering your own journey and how you've moved from one brand mm. to the next or when coming to the next so i think you need to understand who you are mm. and then you need to work within you yeah and stop trying to copy everyone and correct and also stop apologizing for changing jobs and by the way there's enough even evidence anyway to prove that there's an upside sometimes in changing jobs because people change jobs correctly yes tend to end more correct than people who stay in the same correct place forever yeah so there's an upside that if you do it right yes 
you might also end up earning more anyway. Absolutely. Because you negotiate more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you negotiate better. And also you tend to get to learn more about your worth mm. and your value. Yeah. Now, Mzamo, with me, um, you know, coming from a difficult background, it was all about, you know, I need to go to university. It doesn't matter what I study. Mm. I need to go to university, graduate and get a job. Yeah. And one of the courses that, that did not have as many people signing onto it was marketing, yes. right? But I, I promise you, when I, when I, I, I even remember signing that application, I'm like, I do not want to do marketing because it's about selling and I'm not good at selling. Mm. But I didn't have a choice. So I was like, girl, this is the only course that has, you know, a few spaces yeah. in it. You, you don't have a choice. So I always say marketing, cho marketing chose me and not mm -hmm. the other way around. It is only now that I get to appreciate the discipline and how I have been able to apply it in so many different aspects of my life. Yeah. Personally, career-wise, in the work that I do, um, you know, as a brand. Mm -hmm. um, but for you, I'm quite interested in terms of where you did sit from the word go that this is the, the path. That, that you're going to choose um, or it just ca kind of came along um, a as you go? No, I, I was not. I was one of those people who didn't know what they wanted to mm. be. I was not clear. I knew they that I remember growing up, all I wanted was to be a preacher, yes. teacher and a healer. Those are the three things. There you go. The rest was not in my radar. Yeah. And when I worked at UCT, I was teaching, tutoring. Then I realized when I got like a paycheck mm. as a teacher, I was like, oh shit, teachers don't get paid. Yes. And I'm not a, I'm not a believer in follow your passion. Mm. I'm a believer, follow the thing that pays you well. Mm -hmm. The I understand. passion thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. when you're rich, you can find your passion. <laughs> but I for, love, can I just say, oh, I'm sorry. I love that honesty yeah. because a lot of people do that. Yeah. They get into a certain picture. No, and money is not important. No, no, I need money. No, no, no. I grew up poor. Yes. So I know poverty and I know it's very important to cry in an air-conditioned place than in a shack. Because I yes. grew up in a shack. So I, I know it's better to cry in a Mercedes with an aircon in than to <laughs> cry in a bicycle yes. or taxi rank. I just thought when I was at UCT, I need to buy my mother a house. Mm. And there was no way mm. with that. My passion was teaching. Mm. It will always be. Mm. But it didn't pay. Mm. So I then thought, bugger this thing. Mm -hmm. Let me go look for something that pays 10 times more. Okay. So that I can take care of my mother, mm. take care of my sisters, buy my mother a house, mm. move my mother out of RTP houses in mm. Kailija. Mm. So I went to do interviews. Unilever called and said, hey, I went to a mock-up interview, actually. Okay. And the mock-up interview, I, apparently I did well. Okay. And mine was to learn how to improve interview skills. Yes. And the interviewer was an HR manager at Unilever, called me and says, hey, we liked you in those interviews. You're very strong. And you've got a statistics and maths background. Mm. And we're looking for researchers, statisticians, would you like to come for final interviews? Okay. And I was like, okay, where? She says in Durban. And I was like, well, shit, I've never been to Durban. I said, are you going to fly me? Yeah. They said, sure. I was like, oh, tick. I didn't have to fly <laughs> there. And then I said, I'm only going to come if you keep me there for five days. Because now I'm thinking, even if I don't get the job, it be... And he said, five days yeah, in Durban. Five days in Durban. <laughs> I get to see Durban. And then I'm cool. When I, get the job, when I get job. the job or not, I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. So I get there and I get the job. And I hear while being interviewed that they are looking, that I was the only statistician, mathematician there. Uh. So I was thinking, oh, shit, okay, then I will stand out. Uh. So let me make sure yeah. at least. And I got the job and I joined Unilever. The truth is I had no passion. Like I, the one thing which luckily for me mm. is that I have always been curious about people, mm. why people do the things they do. So even as a teacher, you are curious about how do you mold a mind? How do you change mm. a person? So I was liking that I was in the discipline mm. that was about why people do the things they do. Mm. It was a behavioral science. Mm. It was statistical science. So I was actually, I was not far off mm. from my strength. But it was more by luck than yeah, by yeah, divine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then after that, when I was in research, 
doing behavioral science, statistical research. I then got into marketing because I was consulting to brand managers, marketing directors, CMO. Then I realized that instead of telling them what to do, I think I can do that job. Okay. So I'm just going to move out of being a researcher or consumer and market insights and move into marketing. So for me, it was never... I'm still to this day a believer that if you grow up poor, I think it's bad advice to say follow your passion. Thank you. I think if you grow up poor, follow the money trail. And then you'll get the passion. <laughs> then the passion <laughs> will come through will after. Come through afterwards. And just work hard and 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 don't forget who you are. Guys, we don't have time to play around seeking passion. Our, our families are very poor, like they're in poverty, yes. right? So I get you. I absolutely get you. Yeah, it's like, like, sorry, like you reminded me, someone said, um, you don't need school. Mm. And then I said to them, that's an, you're an idiot. Mm. <laughs> if you are poor mm. and you come from a marginalized group, yeah. black, mm. person with disability, sexual orientation, mm. a woman, you better stay at school. Yeah because the upsides are better mm. because you already have struggles yeah you in that you don't have privilege yeah so you're not like someone else who might have privilege that they might not need school mm. because they have access mm. you don't have it mm. so and the, the the myth that the wealthiest people didn't go to school is also a lie mm. because almost all of silicon valley the 90% plus of founders who did unicorns mm -hmm. have a degree. Yeah. Over 20% of them have a PhD. Mm -hmm. Over 60% of them have a master's degree. So this logic that, no, but look at Mark Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. He didn't go to school. Look at the founders of Google. They drop out of school. Mm -hmm. That's nonsense. The founders of Google drop out doing PhD. Mm -hmm. And also what people forget. The privilege they had of privilege. being able to drop out. Yeah, but also they forget one thing. The founders of Google did computer science at age six, seven. They were already coding. <laughs> and they started their business. If your home doesn't have three garage doors <laughs> or two garage doors, this story doesn't apply to you. It, it applies to people who have three garage doors, yeah, yeah. two garage doors. I mean, the founders of Google, one of the founders, their father was a professor on computer science. Yeah. My mother was a domestic worker, zero garage door. I yeah. lived in a house they call Vezinyao. Like basically the front and the back is the same. <laughs> I could just measure it quickly. And I could see the distance between front door and back door is tiny, yeah. one meter or mm. two. And so I feel like poor people are told lies mm. that we then make and we take this narrative that only is for privileged people. Mm. And we make it our narrative. Mm. We need school. Mm. There's enough evidence that proves that educated people post grade 12 mm. have a 63% premium wage mm. versus people who drop out of high school. Mm. Even if you ended up not with your dream yes. job, but just, yes, there's also people who will tell you, but I'm a graduate and unemployed. Mm. But the unemployment in a rate, better chance. The unemployment rate in being a graduate mm. versus being unskilled mm. is lower mm. statistically versus so all these like bad shit stories we're being told like for me if you're poor mm. that's just don't believe the shit that people tell you. No, no, I, I like this because you are bringing, you are not romanticizing mm. the journey of, of where you are. You are bringing the practicality of what it took and what it will take. Um, honestly, what you're saying, listen, I've had family members dropping out or not even pursuing that route because they want to pursue entrepreneurship mm. with no backup whatsoever, yeah. no funding. Um, so I, I like the practicality of, listen, if you don't go, this is where you might end up, right? This is you. This will be your ceiling. But if you go all the way, l literally what you just said, <laughs> I chased money and now I can chase my passion. Yeah, that's it. I mean, the probability, I was saying to someone once that I studied, I was looking at data because I'm a statistician on yeah. what's the probability of a player who's English Premier League mm. at an academy, Arsenal, Barcelona, mm the top teams of making it 
to the first team. Mm. It's so low. Mm. And they are already in the academy. Yeah. And it's single digit percentages. Mm. It's low. The probability of being Trevor Noah, the next Trevor Noah, mm. it's point zero zero zero. I'm not saying that it's not possible, mm. but the, the stats are so low mm. that to think that you can be the next... Trevor Noah is an outlier. Mm. Statistic terms, he's an outlier. Yes. He's not normal. He's yes. not average. Yes. So now to think you can become him... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it's not possible, but it's an outlier. Yeah. And the bulk of us are in the bell shape curve, in the average. Mm. Most of us actually are in the average, not extremely high IQ. Most of us actually just average. We're and just we, okay. We're just okay. We, it's, we are not extremely Elon Musk, high IQ, Yay. gifted. You can think. And I would say to someone, it's impossible to think about Silicon Valley mm. when you're broke. Mm. I, it's just, if you don't have food, you don't have three garage doors or two, and you are hungry, and your mother is always telling you there's no money. Just go to school. Joke, it's impossible to think about the big ideas like a Tesla. Mm. Like, it's, it's just because your brain is living in scarcity. Mm. And if you live in scarcity you then have less mental bandwidth mm. to, to dream even bigger things. Mm. It's not that you are not capable of doing it. It's just that you are in scarcity. Mm. When I was in scarcity, I never dreamt that I'll be a global, yeah. I'll be a CMO for Google. It's just, it was impossible mm. to be in a shack and be thinking that way. It's just scarcity mm. does that to your brain. Mm. It even lowers your IQ sometimes, scarcity. Mm. So that's why for me, I genuinely think, First, don't be broke. Just get out of being broke. It will increase your mental bandwidth tenfold. Then you might start thinking things that you never thought about mm. before. And now you start thinking things like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Mm. Oh, yeah, I can do that. And all of a sudden, even your self-esteem, your confidence, and that you know you are enough yeah. starts kicking in. Like, and when people tell you things about you, they just become opinions, not facts. Zamo, <coughs> we're going to play a rapid fire question. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Don't think about it. Death and mm. 10 seconds. First thing that comes into your mind. Favorite ad jingle of all time? Bull brand. Okay. Is that bull brand thing? Like, it's a song. How <laughs> does it go? Kula. It's an old that was song. before my time. Yeah, this is like, that thing really stayed with me. <laughs> Before my time, okay. And also I was poor, so bull brand was like premium. Like if you could eat bull brand, <laughs> that was like, you've made it. <laughs> because meat was expensive. Oh wait, is that the, the, that meat on e, 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 at 13th? Yeah. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Okay, okay. You know, that was like premium stuff <laughs> for poverty, poor people. So I still remember it, like a, a choir and people singing in Kosa, Zulu, Sisutu. Yeah, and yeah. It's just, it stayed in my is head. Is it still there? I've never seen it on... Okay, anyway, um, what's your worst um, ever career choice? I've been lucky. Is it? Eh? So, I've been, had a, been lucky. I've been had a, the only bad experience I had was moving to the UK and when I, when I had a bad boss. Oh. And really bad. Really nasty. And then I packed my things and I left. How, how long did you stay? I uh, stayed for over a year. What? How long were you supposed to stay? Uh, forever, actually. Oh, gosh, okay. So I, then I packed my things and I left. That was really, I won't say it was a bad career trip, but it was just, I, it was just bad. for once I got a bad leader. Yeah. yeah. That could either make or break you, though, yeah. I understand. Mm -hmm. I think I know the answer to this already, um, but I'm going to say it anyway. Teaching a class of, uh, full of teenagers or managing a team of corporate hotshots? I'll take corporate hot shots. Teenagers are poor bread. In this woke generation, <laughs> they, have, they woke, they have opinions, they think they confuse overconfidence with competence. Mm. And they know so little, but I, I can't, I feel like this. And then their parents who will defend every nonsense their child does, like, yeah, I can't do it. I think I'll just... <laughs> I will lose it. What's the your most memorable or favorite campaign you've ever, ever worked on? Nike. Because mm. when we did the World Cup 2010, yeah. my most memorable 
is actually not even a campaign per se with coming up with an idea yeah. to build a Nike football training center Excellent. in Soweto. Ah. And that's still there and millions of kids pass through there ah. and that we were going to use football as a tool for social change. And that yeah. you, came, you bring them in through football, but then you teach them life skills, you teach them about sex, sexuality, you give confidence, you yeah. teach them they are enough. For me, when I think about making money soulfully yeah. at a, in a soulful way yeah that was for me that that the idea that you can use football mm. as a tool for social change at a profit and still do something something that more. when you look at every day when i pass in soweto mm. it's still there and that was like 10 12 years ago yeah. and i can still see it mm. and i can look at it and point and say we I was did part that. of that. And look, and still, millions mm. of kids are passing through it and impacted, and their lives will change. Now, considering what you told me about uh, going for a mock interview and actually landing up a job mm -hmm. from a mock interview that you did not even plan, how do you... You know, when I was doing my introduction, I was talking about young people that want to stand out mm -hmm. um, because now the job market is very competitive and very hard. What are some of the pointers that you would give to young people listening to this interview, considering how incredibly well your journey has been? You know, I now know it as I'm closer to 50 that when I was 21, someone told me that I'm full of shit mm -hmm. and I'm a a shit steer, okay. instigator. And I can see that. I mean, why would they yeah. think that? Uh -huh. And then I was like, at first I was, didn't like it because okay. I thought it, it was an insult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I learned that the more I am me, mm. I read a quote when it says, be you and the world will adjust. Yep. There's only you. Mm. And the more you do all you can to be you mm. and not try to be anyone else copy paste and just be you yeah and the more you are you mm. you have a far better chance mm. for me that's the first thing and this what helped me mm. to gain more self-awareness was therapy okay i really believe that if you can mm. and you can afford mm. or you can find a therapist even when you start a job, yeah. right, they offer free yes. <laughs> these consultations. Correct. Don't go because you have anxiety attacks or panic attacks or you're clinically depressed. Sometimes go to therapists to learn, how do I show up? Mm -hmm. How do I score on goals? Because I learned early that earlier on, my first two years at work, I had low self-esteem. Okay. I had lots of self-doubt mm. and I externalized blame a lot. Okay. The first thing I did was externalize it to white people. Mm. Yeah, they were the first people to easy to blame. <laughs> they yeah. were there. Because when you had a computer. Yeah, but also they up. were there in public. <laughs> so they were the first people I could easily blame. Yeah. Like, yeah, the white people, yeah. it's their fault. And then I could blame people who went to private school. Okay. Because I didn't have the accent, uh, the English fluency. Yes. So I blame them that they talk fast in meetings. They don't give people who went to Bantu education a chance. And then as soon as I went to therapy, I realized that, no, mm. the problem is actually me. Yes. And 90% of my issues were me, mm. were not other people, mm. were just actually me. I needed to stand up for myself. Mm. The day I learned to speak up in meetings and tell everyone, from now on, I don't need interpreters, translators, okay. John, it's not your job to say what Mzamo is trying to say. Mm. Gone are those things now. <laughs> Mzamo is going to say what Mzamo wants to say. If you don't understand Mzamo, ask. Yes. But no more what Mzamo is trying to say. Yes. I'm done. Because we have people here who from, come from Holland, okay. Japan, who can't speak you never, English. You never do but that. we never say what Case is trying to say. Yeah. Or what Masaki Nagaki is trying to say. We are patient and we're nodding and listening and now with my broken Bantu education English everyone's thinking so that was the thing the mm. second thing I had to learn was English is not a measure of intelligence mm -hmm. just because I was not fluent in English mm. it didn't mean I was not smart yeah and there are many things in this world that have been 
invented mm. without English. Mm. People who wrote Nobel Prize winners yeah. who wrote in German, mm. in Russian, but they didn't speak English. Yeah. So I had to get that out of my mm. and decolonize my own mind. Mm. And then the other thing was just read. For me, Steve Biko is the best friend I've ever had. Mm. He helped decolonize my mind. Mm. Franz Fanon helped decolonize my mind because I had a lot of inferiority okay. complexes as a black, poor, but I really genuinely thought I was inferior. Mm. And that was internalized by me. Mm. Even though this Bantu education taught me. Yeah. But it was so I had to do a lot of I feel like if we could help young people do more work going inward mm. and learning how do I score own goals? How do I make mistakes? Mm. How do I show up? How do I stop othering, blaming mm. everyone under the sun? Mm. Apartheid, yes, apartheid, yes, did a number mm. on us, but hey, it is what it is. Mm. Yes, your father didn't raise you mm. like me, was absent. Yes, yes, you grew up poor. Yes, fine. Yes, all those things did happen. Mm. We're not going to deny them, but still, you have agency. Mm. And so for me, if anything I could say to you, now my young self is, if I had developed more self-awareness yes. at a young age and I had owned up and I took individual responsibility yeah. for my fuck-ups, mm. I would have gone further than I have even now. Okay. Because then I would have owned up mm. and I would have taken individual responsibility mm. without saying, for example, I tell my sisters mm. and my daughters, yes, there's toxic patriarch, mm. there's toxic masculinity, but you cannot tell me that it accounts for 99% of the reasons why you as a woman, you are not progressing. Mm. It's mathematically, statistically impossible. Mm. You also have to say, what are you doing mm. and what are you not doing to ensure that you succeed? Yeah. Same, as a black person, I cannot ascribe or link all my poverty to white people mm. and 99 percent say it's white people mm. are the reasons why i'm it's all witchcraft which in the village i grew up in 90 percent of problems were linked to witchcraft <laughs> next door there's certain, there's certain things you can't say or do yeah. because then you're gonna yes you, you know like bring uh, all the bad energy yeah so i feel like if yeah. if school there's one area at school that i feel i could be done more of in life orientation yeah. when they teach life orientation okay. is who am i mm. how do i become enough mm. and how do i get to a point where i believe that i'm enough mm. and how do i get to a point where i take individual responsibility for my life Shit. and i take accountability mm. i own up to the, my own own goals i stop othering and i spend very little time mm blaming and accusing others mm. and spend more time holding myself accountable yeah. and then be you for me i found like ever since i've been me i've been okay actually and all i found was some people like me some people hate me and the thing i always say to people there's only two things that are liked by everyone it's money and what okay you're not gonna be liked by everyone and you are not money Okay. And you are not water. Even God has enemies. Even <laughs> Jesus Christ was crucified. I mean, if that guy came here to save people, look what happened to him. He's dead. He's not here. And same. I can't. So I, I'm kind of like, if you want to be liked by everyone, you are not TikTok. Mm. You are not Facebook. You are not Instagram. You're not YouTube. You must be okay yeah. that half like you and half dislike you. It actually means you're doing something right. Correct. The one thing I, I think I just got from, from what you said, uh, Nzamo, is being just self-aware. And I think from the moment that we started talking, there was just, and, and you were, you remember when you were introducing yourself and mm. your values, I felt like there was such a sense of peace with who you are that I think a lot of people, like, honestly want that from them for themselves mm. and i think that's what i'm getting out of it to you for, for someone to be able to attain that 
you have to go through the steps of what have what can I do? Um, what responsibility can I take? Yep. And and that self awareness, um, I think that's just profound, and and that's personal to me also, and and what I take from from this podcast. Um, so just before we we end off, let's go back to the snacks. Mm. Can I say, can I can I guess why this is the first time? Is it a really nice um, hangover cure? No, mine is is poverty deprivation. It's nothing to do with. Oh, so the minute it's, you had money, this is what she's like. You yeah, because you know, like when you go to school and then you had like cheese boys. Okay. Those kids who had like lunches with cheese and yes, yes. marmite. Was it marmite or those? Yes. Like, yes. I didn't have that shit. So I had to walk <laughs> home every day. I had to run home, yeah. eat, run back. To this day, my worst thing is. I eat fast mm. because I didn't grow up with a table. Yeah. So I had to eat fast, run. And so snacks, like you see a kid with like snacks and you, you look at it, you're like, wow, do people have that thing? Like it's just a snack. And also, also <laughs> even if you do have something, usually you will have like a steam bread. Yeah. Re- you're not going to bring steam bread No, I mean, it's not you, cool. You might like... as well run back and have a slice of steam bread <laughs> and then go back to school. Yeah, I mean, what are the chances of even being liked by a lady <laughs> in high school where you're bringing fed cook? Uh, <laughs> and like, let's share. Whereas if you had a power and, or something... <laughs> It increased your chances. It, yes, it was just like, so for me, it was more like I link these things to deprivation. Mm. And I remember the time when I didn't have. Like yeah. for me, birthdays were things I didn't celebrate. Yeah. Because I was born on the 4th of February. Mm. And people are broke. Yes. On the 4th of February, you there's still no money. from the December there's, holiday. There's nothing. So I learned to not ask. Mm. I learned to not expect. Mm. To this day, I struggle to celebrate birthdays mm. because it's just something I blocked mm. because I didn't want to bother my mother yeah. and bother people. Same with when I see Bawan, or I always think like, wow, I remember <laughs> not having. Mm. And now I can just buy the whole box that <laughs> I want to do. i serious. The first thing I did when I started working, I bought KFC, you know, like KFC. No, 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 Yes. Or there has to be like a special occasion yes. where like you dress up to go to town. Yes. Like it was not a thing you just, Jay, you ate just because you're craving for KFC. So I thought when I started working, that's it. I am going to kill this craving. <laughs> Buy this bucket of 21, 21 piece. piece. Yes. Sit there at home all by myself. And I'm not going to share. No sharing. <laughs> This time you ate it over a couple of days. I chowed that thing like I was so happy. <laughs> and then I got sick. I was of like, course you didn't get sick. <laughs> I got so sick. I was of like, course you didn't get sick. I was nar and just <laughs> sick, but. You were happy. I was so happy. <laughs> and what it did, it ended. You never, people underestimate them. Poverty, pent up desire yes. that you grow up with, the cravings, the the constraints. Yes. Violence. So for me, that was the thing. Same with Bowen. And Bowen, there was a time when it was bigger than this. Like. So this and, is. Yeah, I feel like they. Yeah, there was a time it was bigger. And I just felt like, same, like beacon bites. And so for me, it's just, I whenever I have a beacon bite or I have a Bowen, I don't eat, like to show that. I've seriously transcended. Eh. I don't eat meat. Okay. And that's a privilege of yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can't be poor and be choosy. Yeah, yeah. And be like, no, I don't eat meat. I don't eat chicken. I don't eat red meat. I don't eat pork. I know I didn't have those blessings when I was growing up. Yeah. Now, I, I, you can choose. I'm, I don't eat yes. those things. Purely not because now I can't afford them. Yes. But because I just choose. The preference. So now I have freedom, mm. which I didn't have before. Yeah. Same now when I see a bar one, pick on by now it just reminds me how 
free I am. Mm. It's just freedom. These are the things that we take for granted. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. It's just because smooth, yeah. anyone else that will buy this, we just buy it for, I mean, we can afford it. But now that you're just telling the story, it makes you just think about how far someone has traveled yeah. and for us to be here. Yeah, no, it's a long, it's been a long mm. ride. But also now when I look at Bawan, I always think in, in Islam, when I used to go to the mosque and they talk about Allah is merciful mm. and full of grace. Mm. And I look at my life and I'm like, mm. damn, actually Allah and my ancestors have been mm. merciful mm. and full of grace because the odds of me having been here are actually low because most of my friends are in Polsmo prison. They are drug addicts or alcoholics mm. or dead. Everyone I grew up with, 80%, they didn't make it. So it's mm. kind of when you now look back, you realize like, oh my goodness, you must have more gratitude. Yeah. And you must say thank you yeah. a lot because it could have been... Could have been worse. Worse. And I had cases growing up where I could have easily mm. have landed in jail. And like people, I always say to them, my father, stepfather, mm. blessed his soul. When he found out we were dealing in drugs, yeah. because this other guy got stabbed or got shot by drug dealers, and he tossed a bag, and I picked it up, and when we opened it, it had drugs, and we thought, ooh, we're going to start our own empire. Okay. Mm, because that's like, look normal, yeah. where I grew up. My father heard about this, my stepfather, and instead of shouting and mm. punishing me, he took me to scouts. Mm. So I joined Boy Scouts mm. because my stepfather found out that we were now studying this, this empire. drug empire okay. business and he saved my life. Mm. So it's moments like those which I was not in Could have been a split of a second. A second, yeah. yeah. So I joined Scouts and then I'm in Scouts all my life till second year varsity. Mm. And all I learned in Scouts is all oh, these badges. And I'm like, I'm going to have all of them. Mm. And I want my arm to be full of badges. That's when I also knew that, oh, I like achievement. Yay. I like trophies. I like badges. So I like certificates. I like... So then all I did was, all my weekends, mm. I'm not at home. When I come back, my friends are either arrested mm. or in jail or stabbed. So scouts, mm. through my stepfather, saved me. Mm. So that's another thing I'll always say with young people. Don't be idle. Mm. Find something to do. Keep yourself busy. busy. Because if you have a high IQ, like I do, okay. their brain will find something to do. Yeah. And it doesn't discriminate whether it's good or evil. It just wants just something. to be used. And whereas if you are idle, you are in deep shit. Like if, if you are poor and idle, hmm. I even think it applies to privileged people because I see now yeah. my kids they have privilege and as soon as they idle I can see now why they need more therapy why they need more therapy why I need to pay more for therapists because now they have existential problems yeah the meaning of life when I was, when I was poor I didn't have time to be thinking about <laughs> meaning of life my kids have a lot of time now to think about what's the meaning of life why am I here how do I self-actualize? Mm. Me, I was just thinking, how do I get bread and eat and sleep well? Mm. And how do I survive another stabbing or gunshot? Gosh. Which they don't have to do that. So I feel like, yeah, it's been all these things for me, snacks, these, it's just grace mm. and mercy along the way. And that someone cared. Yeah. And no one goes up alone. Someone cared enough to put me on the right path, to take me to Boy Scouts, to someone. If they didn't do that on my own, mm. I know I would have not done yeah. well. Guys, I've never met anyone so grounded and who's literally defined by the journey that they've traveled and who does not forget what it took for him to be here. The reason I'm saying that is because we often forget once we've reached where 
we wanted to be. We forget what it took for us to mm. be there. And that, that's just what I'm getting out of it. And someone who's full of gratitude of, of where they are. May, may we take a, something out of Mzamo's story. Thank you for that. Thank you. Guys, this is where we end it off. I am full. I'm full of so much um, that I'm taking from Zamo's story that I'm definitely going to apply in my own life. Um, please catch this episode and many other episodes on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, thank you so much for joining me. I'm Nazbele Tamgana Mayaba. Don't hold back. Say it loud.